What dog breeds have the most lipomas? And why are pet food companies fleeing Facebook? <laughs> Welcome back to Off-Label Veterinary News, your source for commentary on animals, medicine, and practice life. If this is your first time, just go ahead, hit the subscribe button, it's free, so we can grow this channel and reach as many veterinary colleagues as possible. Let's jump in to some of the stories you might have missed. New study discovers what dog breeds are most susceptible to lipomas. If you're a veterinary professional, you're familiar with those benign fatty tumors that cause tremendous anxiety amongst our clients known as lipomas. Up until a recent study, we really didn't know the prevalence of lipomas in dog breeds in general practice. It took an esteemed team of our English counterparts at the Royal Veterinary College to determine that Yes, about 2% of all the dogs seen in a general practice setting developed a lipoma. But perhaps to me, the most interesting facet of this publication was what breeds were most commonly predisposed to lipomas. Springer Spaniels, Doberman Pinchers, Weinreiners, and Labs were the most susceptible to lipomas. Our British authors eruditely concluded that older, overweight dogs were more likely to have lipomas than younger, skinnier dogs. Thank you for that insight. One other interesting tiny tidbit that I discovered in this paper was that insured dogs were more likely to be diagnosed with lipoma than uninsured dogs. Now, at first this seems silly, but think of it. People who have pet insurance were more likely to pursue diagnostics and treatment options than those who were not. And that's a really important point because while 2% of these tumors turned out to be lipomas, we don't know how many of these tumors were much more serious or even potentially malignant. What do you think off-labelers about this latest study? Does it help you understand lipomas better? And maybe does it give you any insight into how to communicate more effectively with our clients? I wanna hear what you have to say about fatty tumors, and more importantly, how can we prevent pet obesity in the first place to reduce just another risk of obesity? I wanna hear from you. Why are pet food companies fleeing Facebook? Facebook seems to be fading in favoritism for pet food companies over the past year. Recent market research published by Gartner L2 discovered that pet food companies were using Facebook a lot less than they were this time a year ago. Over the past five quarters, Gartner L2 reports that pet food companies have reduced their social posting and interactions by about 79%. So if they're not posting on Facebook, where are they going? And the answer, to no one's surprise, is Instagram. Between April 2017 and June 2018, pet food companies nearly tripled their Instagram post. And now about 83% of all pet food companies and brands in the US have an Instagram page. The top five pet food companies who are still active on Facebook were using promoted posts to drive most of their interactions. And the top performing Facebook pet food brand was Halo, topping nearly 50,000 brand interactions. But again, this is significantly down over the past two years. So while they are fleeing Facebook, they are embracing Instagram with renewed vigor and resources. And one of the things that Gartner points out is that, hey, this is where many of the ideal demographic pet owners are interacting. So if you have anyone in your family who is a millennial, or if you're like me, you just like to look at the pictures, Instagram is the place to be. Now, obviously it's a different type of social interaction, but off labelers, are you finding that your clients are more on Instagram these days? And are you finding more interactions and more successful marketing or promotions around your Instagram campaigns as opposed to Facebook? Now, I wouldn't abandon Facebook just yet because there's still billions of people that are using Facebook. But if I'm a veterinarian today, I'm gonna to be paying close attention to these social media trends and make sure that I am applying these strategies across multiple social media platforms. For me, they have not changed over the past three or four years. It's Facebook, it's Instagram, it's YouTube, and then it's Twitter and Pinterest and Snapchat and all those other things. So really continue to focus on the big three of Facebook, 
Instagram, and YouTube, and I think you'll be fine. What do you think, Off Labelers? I want to hear from you. Are you playing on the Instagram team more than you used to? Let me know. Well, that's it for another edition of Off Label Veterinary News. If you like content like this, do me a huge favor and hit that subscribe button. And don't forget to ring the notification bell so you'll be notified as soon as content like this drops on your internet doorstep. Until next time, keep living that off-label life. Bye.